sauti ya wajiri wetu Tunasema asante wajiri wa sante Wanachara sante washiri kasante Tunasema asante wajiri wa sante Wanachara sante washiri kasante Sema asante wajiri wa sante wanacha
shirikisho yetu sauti ya wajiri wetu tunasherekea uhusiano wetu shirikisho yetu sauti ya wajiri wetu tunasherekea uhusiano wetu shirikisho yetu sauti ya wajiri wetu tunasherekea uhusiano wetu shirikisho yetu sauti ya wajiri wetu tunasema asante wajiri wasante wanachama asante washirika asante tunasema asante wajiri wasante wanachama asante washirika asante Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you are fine and keeping safe wherever you are across the country and beyond. In Nairobi, it's quite sunny. We do pray you also have good weather wherever you are. We had about 150 delegates yesterday attending, and we expect uh, the same turnout today as well. Uh, this is our final module today. Uh, and we have our executive director, our CEO, Mrs. Jacqueline Mugo, 
who is going to give us her opening remarks and to put everything in context as we get started. As usual, you'll keep posting your questions on the Q&A wall and your comments on the chat box. And we shall have a Q&A session later on, which uh, we, we will attend to all those questions. Today, we'll make it even more interesting. We have contributions from industry. Uh, some of you will be speaking live on your experiences on collective bargaining. So without much ado, allow me to welcome our CEO, Mrs. Jacqueline Mugo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure for us to host you on this beautiful sunny morning here in Nairobi. Some of you may be out of Nairobi, so we don't know what kind of weather you have, but you know the sun always changes once mood. As Eric has said, today is the final module in the masterclass that we launched on Tuesday on emerging issues in labor relations. And um, we are very happy that you are able to join us today. We on Tuesday covered the evolving nature of industrial relations. Yesterday, we covered the impact of COVID-19 on workplaces. And today we are looking at significant trends in collective bargaining. According to the ILO convention number 154, collective bargaining is a process through which employers and workers' representatives, that is trade unions, determine conditions and terms of employment. Collective bargaining in many ways is a foundation of labor relations because that was the reason why unions many years ago pushed for unionization and the right to representation because they wanted a greater say in the terms and conditions of service for the category of employees that we call the unionizable cadre of staff. And to a large extent, the success with which we carry out collective bargaining impacts the climate of labor relations because it gives you a set way of agreeing on the terms and conditions of service and therefore managing conflicts, specifically those conflicts that are related to how much do you earn, what are your working hours, what other benefits do you have? Of course, we know there are many other conflicts that are managed through a more established grievance handling procedure, which could include issues arising out of collective bargaining. But it is, in our view, the foundation, one of the main pillars of labor relations. And why is FKE well placed to lead you through this conversation? This is what we've done for over 60 years. This is one of our main areas of expertise because we are very keen to see that the climate in which labor relations is done and the climate in which discussions on employees' terms and conditions of service is friendly. We are the voice of employers in employment and social policy, and also one of the main activities, one of the main services that we offer is to chair collective bargaining agreements almost on a daily basis for both individual member organizations and for sectoral associations and groups, various groups that negotiate with unions. So our role in collective bargaining it comes as a result of the expertise that we have built over the years. It's a learning process. We are also consistently learning new tricks, new tactics of managing this as issues keep arising. But it is one of the main areas of service that we offer to you as members. We guide employers, we give them the factors uh, that determine their offers and counter offers to trade unions. We do comparisons in what is happening in the economy. What are the employers giving? What are the trends that we are seeing? What are the new demands that are coming from trade unions? And are these negotiable items? In the event that you're not able to agree with trade unions, perhaps because the demands of the unions are too ambitious and you can't afford them, we also represent you in the Employment and Labor Relations Court. But should the negotiation process be concluded to the satisfaction of both parties, we also ensure that you comply with the law in terms of registration. But today, this has uh, become an even more complex issue arising from COVID-19 pandemic, which has changed the landscape in which business is done. It has made negotiations very difficult and the process a little more complex. 
In fact, for most of last year and until now, most collective bargaining agreements uh, have been put on hold for those that were completed. And for many organizations, that process has not started. Although, as our facilitator will tell you, we're beginning to see agitation on the part of trade unions for some level of review of the terms and conditions of service. But we have maintained that because of the low business turnover, the priority must also be placed on business continuity and how to save jobs. So we have been sharing with you about the initiative we took in leading a conversation that led to the signing of a tripartite agreement, which sets the framework in terms and conditions of employer-employee engagement. And we will be discussing this because it's a, a very strong foundation of the climate in which negotiations is being done and will be done where that is possible. We believe that as stakeholders in the labor market, uh, that is employers, unions, and the government, we have a shared responsibility to ensure that both parties' interests are addressed and that we achieve a balance between safeguarding jobs, reviewing employees' terms and conditions where that is possible, but also ensuring business recovery and ultimately business continuity. In fact, now, as we face the third wave, there are lots of considerations about whether or not there should be other restrictions imposed by government to stem the rise in the rate of infection. So that will impact uh, the rate to which we are able to do collective bargaining. We believe that collective bargaining should be done in a voluntary, in a free and trustful atmosphere. It is based on good faith, trust between the parties. Of course, the parties are free to engage in collective bargaining and there should be no interference from the authorities in their decisions to do so. It must be done in free and voluntary heart, as we say. So the interests of the members of the trade unions and the employers, the parties that are negotiating comes first and they should be able to agree freely based on the determinants of increments. But I wanted to end with a quote because there are a lot of employers, and as Moses will tell you, who fear trade unions. They fear this process of collective bargaining. But we believe that to fulfill the promise of economic opportunity, we must remain true to the principle that collective bargaining is a cornerstone of a free society and is indispensable to a strong middle class. As a quotation from Thomas Perez. All of us who are participating in this class this morning actually belong to the middle class. And so is this true for you? Do you believe this quotation? Uh, or are we perhaps being a little too ambitious as the Federation? To take us through this class are two gentlemen who are very experienced in these uh, fields. Um, the lead uh, discussant uh, this morning, because I think Moses, you, you're just leading conversations. You're giving some highlights, but also you're leading discussion around this. Moses Mbok is a senior industry relations officer here at the Federation with many years standing, having worked in industry and having managed uh, one of our regional branch offices. He's here and one of the areas where he works uh, very frequently is sharing uh, negotiation me uh, meetings and he'll be able to share with you what his uh, view is and what he has seen as the trends. He will be supported by Joseph Nyaga, who is a, also a senior industrial relations officer here at FKE. And of course, uh, managing this whole master classes for us is our consulting and training manager, Eric Munyobi. And because I'm here, I'm balancing the gender, although it's, it's gentlemen that are leading the conversation. So with those few remarks, it is indeed my pleasure to open this third module and to wish you a very interactive session. So Moses, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Executive Director, for the, the powerful uh, introductory remarks. And dear participants, as you have been taken through uh, by our CEO, you will appreciate that uh, the CEO has actually summarized what we are going to do this morning. And uh, mine is just to break it into pieces so that uh, you know where we are coming from. And uh, 
As you have been told, uh, it is today that we are going to do the final module that is uh, going to cover the significant trends in CBA negotiations and with more focus on year 2020 when COVID came. And uh, now turning to our objectives, we expect that by the end of this session, you are going uh, to identify the emerging issues impacting CBA negotiations during COVID-19 under the new normal. Two, you are going to understand the practical strategies for CBA negotiations during the new normal. I keep on emphasizing on the new normal because when COVID-19 happened in the year 2020, uh, things changed and uh, things have never been normal again. We have to change the way we are doing things. I, I, I can remind us of uh, the famous quote from uh, the Minister for Health, that if you treat this pandemic normally, then it will treat you abnormally. And you have seen this happening in all our circles of life. And uh, the third item that we expect you to take home is to appreciate the significance of sharing information on business status to facilitate realistic deliberations during the CBA negotiations. And this is very important uh, for the industry. In a bit, you will see why you must share information. So uh, let, let's have a look at uh, this uh, pictorial. Uh, what are we seeing? We are seeing uh, a lead negotiator. This is an HR director of one of the leading manufacturing firms in the industrial area uh, of Kenya, uh, Nairobi to be specific. You can see uh, this powerful lady taking our negotiation team through what level of preparations they need to have in mind as they go for negotiations during COVID-19. You can see uh, and imagine that she's now talking about what clauses in this CBA must we negotiate? Are there clauses in this CBA that we can suspend for now? And what is the ultimate goal of uh, all this? That is what goes into the preparation. And then the, the next slide now shows you now uh, what constitutes the negotiable items in a typical CBA. I, I would want the participants to appreciate that the CBA has to dimensions. The first dimension of a CBA is what we call the financial clauses. And after the financial clauses, we have what we call the legal or policy clauses of the CBA. The financial clauses actually is what matter most for the employee and for the employer because it goes into the review of their financial entitlements in the contracts of employment. And you will appreciate that negotiating under the COVID-19 took a new twist. In most cases, the unions preferring to just deal with the financial clauses and are saying the legal clauses of the CBA have been taken care of by the law and therefore they don't want to be labor. You can see what we are projecting on the screen. We have the salaries, we have the grievance handling, we have the employee health, we have the process of negotiation, hours of work, we have wages, and then we have also overtime and safety at the workplace. But what would matter most at this point in time are the financial clauses because of the negative impact of COVID-19, how it has impacted on the purchasing power of the employees and the cost of doing business to an employer. So uh, let's go down to the memory lane. In March 13th, 2020, the government of Kenya, through uh, His Excellency, uh, the president, announced the first COVID incidents in Kenya that saw the government rolling out guidelines and protocols to mitigate the spread of the pandemic and its negative effect on the businesses. But soon, the employers and the unions would convene and uh, start thinking about the framework within which the companies would be operating. Uh, this led to the signing of uh, various memoranda of agreement. And uh, like the executive director assembly pointed out, 
the main objective of this memorandum of agreement was how do we ensure that the businesses survive? That was the first intention. The second intention is that as a result of business survival, then we would be able to save the jobs. Then this became the priority. And you can see what happened at FKA. Uh, annually, we do negotiate between 250 and 300 CBS. That is for all FKA regional offices and the headquarters. And uh, last year, 2020, we could only sign 53 CBS that were also negotiated virtually. This is uh, far below uh, what we are supposed to negotiate. And it, it, it talks about how the year was. Very bad for the employers, very bad for the unions. Now, uh, in a bit, I'll be talking to you about what we call the memorandum of understanding and the memorandum of agreement. The memorandum of understanding and memorandum of agreement are a result of what I would call the impact bargaining. In year 2020, most of us were engaged in negotiation of not CBA, but what we call impact bargaining. In what sense, we were addressing the disruption that came with COVID. After COVID had disrupted businesses, we had to retreat and start now uh, reviewing those CBS and even as we negotiate the CBS, abandoning the traditional approach to CBA negotiation. That is why the tripartite social partners, in their wisdom, came up with a now famous memorandum of understanding. And I would want to talk to you a, a bit about the intention of this memorandum of understanding, mm -hmm. having agreed that it was about saving jobs and ensuring business continuity. What were members supposed to have in mind, especially the union and the employer? The memorandum of understanding required voluntarism so that after parties had agreed and uh, made various sacrifices to keep the ship afloat, they would reduce these MOUs in writing. And the next condition was that these MOUs were supposed to be filed with the labor commissioner so that the labor commissioner could guide the parties if they found out that there are some agreements that were entered that would not work for the various industries. And therefore, after that, what followed was that various industries started signing their CBS, beginning with the KQ, the Kenya Airways, and uh, followed by Kenya Hotel Keepers Association. You know, all the hotels were closed so that the government could check the spread of the pandemic. We also had Sisal Growers Association signing the Memorandum of Understanding with Kenya Plantation and Agricultural Workers Union. These CBS, or rather a Memorandum of Understanding, were meant to cushion the business from the negative impact of COVID-19. But I want to tell you about uh, some of the substantial uh, MOUs that I found very interesting. Look at Crown Pens. Crown Pens came up and uh, negotiated with the union to an extent that, look, we want you to help us mitigate the extent through which we can send employees away on unpaid leave. And as long as the employees were meeting their deliverables in terms of production, they were able to minimize the number and the extent of unpaid leave that you would witness there. The hotel keepers is another significant one. We, this was very good because the union sacrificed and the employers to an extent of foregoing uh, their salaries at a time that the hotel were not realizing any meaningful turnover that could sustain their cost of operations. And uh, the list goes on and on and on. But what I would want to emphasize here is that the employers and the unions departed somehow from the spirit and the letter of the tripartite MOU that was signed between Kotu, FK, and Ministry of Labor, to the extent that they were not now filing those memorandum of agreement with the Commissioner for Labor. And this would uh, bring a lot of issues. That is why some of them were not crafting that, uh, those MOUs to capture what an MOU should capture regarding uh, the issues at hand. Now, I said 
that I would want to discuss the departure from the traditional CBA negotiation that brought in the need now to engage in impact bargaining. What do we mean by impact government bargaining? We mean there is a situation where the CBAs have been implemented naturally. The CBAs have been negotiated and concluded when the businesses are doing well. But this comes a situation where some CBAs are ongoing for negotiation, some are being implemented, then COVID-19 comes in as a disruptor. This is what made employers resort to what we call impact bargaining. And I had spoken about the first one being the MOU between FK, uh, KOTU, and Ministry of Labor. The very, very sense is one, to sustain the wage bills arising from uh, those CBS. And then uh, the next issue in those um, uh, memorandum of agreement or MOUs, if you like, was to address uh, the superfluous human capital vis-a-vis -vis the available jobs. Remember when the first curfews came, the employers had uh, no long hours of work so that they would spread their work or even manage shift work. So some employees had to work from home. The next issue was how do you administer leave days? We had unpaid leave, normal and advanced leave, and even sick leave, which has been so controversial. When an employee is diagnosed with COVID-19, how do you treat their days of absence? And when they are tested, who missed the course of testing these employees? This has been an issue. And some, MOA, some MOAs have tried to address this, but still we are seeing a gap. Then we also had disruption of work processes due to change of business model, where some employers would even now introduce outsourcing because you find that likely what you have been doing is changing. Uh, you saw what happened at KQ when now uh, all the flights were, uh, were, were, were grounded and they were not, the pilots were not flying at all at all. Where do you take those employees and the live liabilities that all of us have been uh, grappling with? But most important was, how do you engage in social dialogue while comp complying with COVID-19 guidelines and protocols? The unions and the employers start, uh, stopped meeting, even at the labor office, we could not meet because of the impact of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the next issue that came was how to initiate the impact negotiations. The union and the employers, were reluctant to begin the negotiations because of the uncertainty of the pandemic. So that between the union and the employers who would initiate the negotiations, in most cases, the employer would initiate the negotiations because the employer has a good idea of their business performances. And as they negotiated, the most important issue they addressed was shared priority, business continuity and saving job. But most of these MOUs to date do not have explicit start and end dates because the crisis appears to be uncertain and nobody knows when, when it's going to end. We started talking about COVID-19 and, and after COVID-19. Today, you cannot talk about COVID-19 and after. You talk about how do you survive within the crisis as employers and as employees. And uh, again, most of these MOUs do not have a clause on monitoring and evaluation with a shared responsibility as to what happens when things get bad or when things are getting better. How do you handle yourself as a union, as an employer? But of importance is to address the bigger picture. And that has been overemphasized. I will not belabor that. Now, uh, the next challenge was how do you conduct negotiations under the new normal as you observe uh, the uh, protocols on COVID-19? The government gave guidelines that uh, would now discourage uh, overcrowding. And uh, some of us at FK, we stopped all negotiations because we, we were now thinking about how do you ensure that the union and employer representatives come in a smaller number so that you don't risk contracting COVID-19. And that made us depart from face-to-face -face CBA negotiations. We have CBA negotiations that we have done online. 
And this is where the employers and the unions have started now embracing the digital negotiation platform so that we avoid face-to-face -face negotiations. But sometimes when parties have to caucus, then the union or the employers on their own meet in their boardroom before they come and uh, start engaging their social partners. Uh, the, the fourth emerging issue was about which clauses in the CBA, and, and, and this has been a key issue, which clauses in the CBA are more important and which clauses can be uh, staggered or can be kept on suspension. Then the debate has been economic vis-a-vis -vis legal or policy clauses in the CBA. I can tell you, having negotiated so many CBAs within the Federation and uh, that we have only prioritized economic clauses. There are certain CBAs where the unions will come and they agree with the employer. We are only going to negotiate economic clause like wage increase, house alliance, leave traveling alliance. All the clauses in the CBA would be uh, left or rather retained as it is for the purposes of ensuring business continuity. And the, the, ne the next debate has been, do we address business continuity or do we address enhanced wages? And most parties have been saying, we better get maintain the current wages and ensure that no job is lost for the purposes of job security, as opposed to getting a match and then at the end of the day, some employees lose their jobs. And that came uh, handy with the issue of partisan versus non-partisan agenda. Uh, I know most of us are aware that uh, we have the union elections going on. Sometimes we have had CBA negotiations being overshadowed by those elections where we decide to be partisan and depart from uh, uh, focusing on the main agenda. Now, uh, we have so much going on at the Ministry of Labor where uh, there has been a lot of interventions in mitigating loss of employment through provision of various uh, social protection schemes like compensation for job losses. It is a requirement and parties are encouraged to take cognizance of this as you negotiate your MOUs for interventions. The other issue that you need to look at is what we call resource-based protection. What happens where the management cannot ordinarily give any increment on financial clauses that they have traditionally addressed in the previous negotiations? Then you go for what we call uh, enlarging the cap because the future remains unpredictable. You look at other clauses that can benefit an employee beyond just increase in the salaries or any other financial clauses. And this has worked for other employers. Now, the next challenge we have seen uh, from where we are seated is that most of the MOUs or MOS, if you like, have been poorly drafted so that there is no uh, certainty as to the end and the start date. And even when some MOS are negotiated at the shop floor level, and they are not filed with the Office of the Commissioner for Labor, you find that they, are, they, they have some anomalies that cannot be cured. And some unions have been reluctant to ratify and register these MOS as part of their CBS. And nothing stops you from registering this MOS as part of your uh, subsisting uh, 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 collective bargaining agreement, sorry. And that is why you find uh, like uh, talking about KQ. KQ has been doing MOS and moving to court and filing this as an addendum to the subsisting CBA. What is important about this is that it makes those MOS more legally enforceable than if they were not registered in Employment and Labor Relations Court. Then the next issue that parties have been discussing is how do we then introduce a force majeure clause? A first majeure is a maxim that talks about how parties to any contract beyond a CBA can manage a supervening circumstances that frustrate their ability to implement the same obligations under the said agreement. In CBA negotiations, it is time we thought about a force majeure clauses. 
I can tell you in so many CBS, we have never seen this, but most employers and trade unions rely on recognition agreements, the provisions of industrial relations charter and section 10.5 of employment act, which provide for negotiation and reducing those negotiations in writing for implementation. But it is time that we thought about introduction of a force majeure clauses in the subsequent CPS. Now, the next uh, issue that came about was how do you prepare? How do you prepare before you start engaging in impact negotiations? You need to prepare well as an employer and as a member of uh, associations. There are certain CPAs that are negotiated under associations and they bind on all members of those associations. For example, if you're a member of Kenya Hotel Keepers and Cutters Association, so long as you subscribe to this association, any CPAs negotiated with Kudaya then is binding upon you. But the challenge has been, what happens where some members can hardly implement uh, financial obligations arising from the CBS. This has led to some members now resigning from those associations and uh, opting for uh, negotiations directly with the union. And then we also have uh, online uh, negotiation of CBS where parties to resolve to review specific clauses uh, in the CBA through online negotiation. This is not any new concept. Even in alternative dispute resolution, we see today parties sharing uh, their claims and uh, counter proposals through online and uh, uh, an independent party guiding them to, to a compromise so that those online negotiations are supposed to be embraced under the current uh, uh, circumstances to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Uh, thank you. Now, on uh, the review of contribution to social protection, this is another emerging issue. There are so many CBS and even memorandum of understanding where the employers now are, uh, have been given a reprieve to review or even stop contributing to the uh, various uh, social protection, uh, social security protection schemes. But the major, uh, Part of it has been reviewing this so that uh, the employer can contain the wage bill that comes uh, with implementation of a pension schemes, even the gratuity. We have seen many unions review this downwards. And uh, as you negotiate a memorandum of understanding or memorandum of uh, agreements, you need also <clears throat> to take this into consideration. And that, that, that has been the directive from Retirement Benefits Authority. Yeah. Now, how do you overcome the challenges? Having gone through these challenges, <coughs> uh, the first strategy of, towards overcoming these challenges is that when you are crafting the memorandum of understanding, you need to look at the bigger picture. I think the executive director emphasized on this and I will not depart from this emphasis that those memorandum of understanding, any CBA negotiations must address business continuity number one. Number two, it must address saving jobs agenda and how it impact on the normal negotiation of CBS. The MOS must be carefully crafted so that we do not have disputes like we have had where some MOS are negotiated at the shop floor and the top union officials have not sanctioned. They have not even been registered with the cabinet secretary for labor through the labor commissioner. And you find the union disowning and then the registered and gender disputes at the Ministry of Labor. The MOS must have explicit commencement and end dates. They must be formalized through are having the same file with the commissioner for labor and even proceeding to court where necessary and registering them as an addendum to the subsisting CBS. The third way of overcoming the challenges is to focus on the bigger picture and the common interest so that what the union and the management should be saying as we talk today is that 
The management problem is the union problem. And the union's problem becomes the management problem because we have to coexist. So that when you are doing any change, like a change in business, change in the business model, it should go through a consultative process so that the union understands how it is going to affect their members and how it is going to affect the business ultimately, which we have summarized that the ship must remain afloat. And therefore, parties must also embrace online negotiation <clears throat> during the new normal. And I'm seeing a few unions taking up this uh, very seriously. Maybe it may require some sort of capacity building, but this is what we are doing. Now, uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me uh, to uh, hand over to Mr. Nyaga to handle the question and answer session, uh, which are three, but is summary, uh, summarizing what we have been going through so that uh, you can see what is happening in the industry. So over to you, my brother Nyaga, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, think you have heard from uh, my friend here, Mr. Bonk. He has uh, uh, brought it on board very well. He has summarized it. He has uh, meant us to have an understanding of uh, what is going on currently uh, in the midst of this uh, uh, new normal. And uh, what we are looking at here, we are looking at the trends of the uh, CBA in this uh, new uh, environment. Uh, may I tend to look at the CBA with the mind of uh, balance of scale. And balance of, of scale where there are uh, two partners putting in uh, 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 their content on their side and uh, discussing with the other one so that they can be able to have that skill and balancing because the skill must balance for a continuity of an enterprise, for a continuity of an uh, of, uh, in industrial uh, and, uh, undertaking. This uh, uh, balance of skill must balance because if it doesn't balance, uh, for sure, none of the two will exist. And uh, if it continues, uh, it continues for quite some time, it brings some negative effect. You may know that this is what um, brought about the industrial industrial revolution, and uh, we don't want to, to 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 come into that. So this uh, balance, balance of scale. Uh, what the, the question is: uh, What do you put there? What how do you put there to to, to, to balance your side with, with, the, with, the, with the other side? Uh, do you look at uh, the current position, uh, the current situation only? Not really, because what is what is coming up now? is the, the, the content that was put in the in the CMBA sometimes back. And because they were not felt that time, now that the, 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 the circumstances are arisen, they are coming into play. So that's why maybe when you are doing this negotiation, negotiation when, when you're trying to balance, don't just balance for the, case, uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of balancing. Look at the content that, that you're putting in. Uh, or it, may, it will be okay for now, but in future, will it be okay? Huh? I'm talking uh, about a situation where uh, maybe some employers um, uh, I felt that um, for us to sign this CBE and move on, let's uh, give in me, maybe in a, in a situation like uh, maybe a, 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 a clause on uh, terminal benefits. You say, okay, the union is asking for 70. Why don't we give uh, uh, maybe 50, 50 days for every completion year of size upon, upon termination of law. I'm not uh, I'm going to terminate anybody in, in, the, in the near future. And you're like, so, so long as we sign and we move on, that, then that will be okay. Okay, the, the, the square will balance for now, for the time being. But when, the, when a situation come, like for, for, for now, uh, who saw uh, uh, the, the coronavirus virus coming in, it has come. And uh, many of the employers have, forced, have been forced to lay off some workers in large numbers. So if uh, for you, you are, uh, what you did was to balance the skill as, a, as at that time, because the economy was doing good without looking into the future, uh, you may find yourself uh, in problem. 
uh, when uh, the times are called. So it's good uh, to balance the scale, and as you balance it, look at uh, the current uh, 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 um, environment, and also look at, it, uh, at the future, whether you'll be there or not, the company will be there, and the company will, will have to continue. Okay, having seen that then, I would, uh, because my role was now to uh, uh, take uh, charge of this uh, Q and uh, 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 A, I would go to the, the, the question session. You can see the first question there is, uh, what particular clause in your CBA would be considered for impact in negotiation? So I don't know, maybe I would like put it to you, uh, who would be able to give us uh, an answer to that? I invite you uh, 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 viewers, give us an answer to this. What particular clause in your CBA uh, would, uh, would be considered for impact negotiation? So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to hear from you. Uh, you can raise your hand if you wish to speak, or you can type uh, in the chat box, because this, this we just want to hear from you. And in a short while, we shall also be inviting a few of you from the industry uh, to give us your experiences. Uh, so, in that regard, Peter Wangige, get ready. Leah, Leah Chibi, Kikibi, sorry, get ready. Banis Kasaya, Ann Wamaida, Amos Odiambo, and, and Graham Mwenda. Please get ready. We shall be putting you on air shortly. But in the meantime, let us respond to the question posed by Mr. Nyaga uh, in regards to what kind of clause. Uh, do you think you may want to uh, readdress in your CBS? So we're giving this about five minutes, and then we listen to live comments from the industry. I can see Emma Kerubo's hand is up. Oh, yes, Judy, Judy Kinyanjui. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Judy. We can hear you clearly. Proceed. Tell us your company and then oh, proceed. Right. Thank you. I work for Kenya Tea Packers, Ketepa, bringing you the finest tea every morning. I, I think for me, of course, the first clause would be issues to do with the wage review, the wage clause, which for us, our CBA provides for every two years. Um, we've been in an industry that has been affected many hotels closure, the institutions, because we sell tea. So you can imagine the impact on that. Also, even the spending in the households has had an impact on that. But also that said, uh, one of the clauses where we never really negotiate much, and I've seen that having impact is on areas on sick, sick leave, where you have so, so many days provided. And now as that other issue arose where you're saying, okay, the person has been quarantined, uh, what happens? Uh, we've been treating it as part of the sick leave. Um, but of course, now there have been that raise of maybe more days required. And again, uh, catering of those costs involved with the uh, COVID. And now even you see the issues maybe of death coming in, where they're, they're treated as welfare, where now you you have these clauses, you never really bothered much about them on what would happen in the event of a death of a spouse or family member, there's an amount. But now on foresight, when maybe if touch would uh, you'd have events of death happening how much can the company cater for so for me those are clauses then we'd want not to focus on mainly because of future as mr nyaga uh, alluded thank you thank you very much judy uh, and my colleagues are listening in both both moses and uh, and uh, joseph Mo joseph nyaga and moses Ombo. now we have grace manugu my friend from uh, let, say it yourself. Tell us your comfort yourself. Grace? Hello, Grace? Okay, we seem to not... Let's see, Emma, Emma Kerubo? Good morning. Good morning, Emma. You're quite clear. Proceed. Tell us the company you represent and proceed. Okay, I work for Base Titanium. 
in Kuala Mombasa. And uh, the other issue that would probably be uh, discussed would be the hours of work. Because that's one of the clauses that you would consider, um, given that it would have, given that uh, there have been changes in uh, hours of work, then I think it's important that um, you discuss the hours of work as it would also have impact even on the overtime. That's my contribution. The other, the other clause that would, uh, uh, would be uh, of focus would be termination, the termination clauses, uh, separation clauses, so to speak. Uh, that is the redundancy, the, 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 the days of, um, for the service pay and things like that, because that would also have an impact because you may get to that point where uh, separation has to be an option. So you need to consider that uh, as uh, some of the clauses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Let's try Grace Manugu again. Unmute your, uh, Grace, unmute your microphone. I think that's the issue on your end. Grace? Yes. Oh, oh, you have muted again. Okay. All right, we'll try later. We'll try later. Now let's let's hear from the industry. Peter Wangige. Are you on? We want to put you on air. Uh, good morning, Eric, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Peter Wangige, HR manager for Freight Forward as Kenya. I'd just like to, to comment a bit regarding the, the current trends that we've seen in the industry, the clearing and forwarding industry. One of them is that we used, historically we used to, to uh, negotiate as a, as a group uh, of companies, but uh, after the COVID came, we've seen a trend where companies want to negotiate on their own. Uh, this, is a, this is a diversion from the history because many companies are facing various uh, unique challenges. Therefore, negotiating as a group, it's becoming a bit of a challenge. So they are opt uh, to negotiate individually. We've also, we've also seen a lot uh, the unions uh, engaging the, the company more to understand what is happening because they've seen the impact uh, the COVID has had. We've, quite, we've released quite a number of, of uh, unionizable employees in the last year, and therefore they are now cautious not to be very aggressive going forward. And they are now having more in trying to check what is happening because at the end of the day, they want to sustain uh, employment for their, for their members. And therefore, that, that makes um, conditions going forward become better. We've also seen a diversion from the past where now members, uh, we are now negotiating virtually, which is uh, uh, something that had been happening for the last 28 years that we've had the union. But it's a, it's a good thing uh, that it's also encouraging technology and also encouraging better ways and uh, simpler methods of negotiating. Um, and also to add that we've now seen our shop stewards, the shop stewards representing the, the union members at our place, they, have, uh, they are now uh, to discuss matters openly with the HR because they have an interest uh, of their sustainability of their jobs at their workplaces, as opposed to who to never want to engage with the HR, they only want to side with the union. Now they have seen, based on the loss of jobs that happened last year, they have now a keen interest. And we, we, we see that as a positive change that COVID has brought in our organization. Um, lastly, what I would uh, just want to say is that we've uh, noted that the, the, the union um, officials are now at that point where they are very keen to re even reconsider some of the clauses that have been existing in our CBAs, and they would want to revisit them. Some of them may not be sustainable during this COVID. Perhaps we may want to consult FKE at, the, at some point, how that, then how we approach that, because they are, they are saying they would want to revisit that and review them downwards. But at the end of the day, uh, they would want to bring them back at some, um, some later date. I don't know how that would be done legally, but it's something that 
FKE uh, maybe would want to give uh, some light at the time of answering questions, we can get some uh, hints on how to approach that. I think that is what I would want to, to comment at this point. And definitely uh, going forward now, um, more, more clauses will have to be brought into the CBAs to, to take cognizance of such instances of COVID or in place so that we cushion both the employees and the employers going forward. Much for your time. Very much appreciated, uh, Peter. Uh, Wangige, thank you very much. My colleagues and I have listened and we will uh, be responding to that at some point. Grace Manugu, are you able now to speak? Grace? Okay, let's, okay, let's have Lea, Lea Chebi, Kiki, sorry. Lea Chirchir. Kindly unmute and speak. Good morning, can you hear me now? Yes, quite clear, proceed. Tell us the company you represent and proceed. Yes, I'm uh, Lea Kibi from Eastern Produce Kenya Limited, the producer of the best quality tea in the country. Um, now going to the CBA experience, I'll say that uh, we've had good and bad experiences with the CBA negotiations. In the past, we've had some, okay, first of all, to say that our CBAs are two year, um, they have a, a span of two years, which means every two years we come back to negotiate. So our experience has been that uh, there are certain times when the negotiations are quite easy and the union are very cooperative. And sometimes we, we have concluded CBAs with three or four meetings, but um, we've had also serious experience, difficult experiences where the union has been quite difficult in understanding the plight of the industry when we are having difficulties and we are not able to give a huge increment and uh, it has resulted in disagreements where we've gone for um, conciliation and later on to court and on the ground we've had strikes that were quite destructive to the property. So um, other than that now coming to the current issues of COVID well, uh, as an industry, or as or rather as a plantation sector, we've not been too badly affected by COVID. One, because we are fairly far removed from big cities. So the, the impact of COVID has not been that bad on uh, the labor force. We have also been able to sustain our employment so the impact has not been as bad as in industries where it has impacted directly on the, 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 the business. So with that, having said that, we still, of course, have issues and we want to negotiate uh, favorable, sustainable rates, wage rates. So what happens is uh, when it comes to the legal clauses, we don't seem to have much problems with the union. We get to agree on those quickly because most of them are based on the law anyway. But then the union is always asking for more and more. They, they want uh, very high wages. They also want us to increase everything on monetary clauses. They, they would like uh, an increase on all that. Despite the fact that uh, even within the plantation sector at the moment, we are realizing that the small, some of the smaller companies are really struggling because um, the cost of production has gone quite high and uh, the price of tea has been coming down over the years. We are quite low at the moment. So with, even with all these, the union still insists on uh, wanting very huge uh, wage increases. And this is where we always come to problems. So it's been quite uh, a challenge for us to make them appreciate uh, 
the the fact that the prices of tea are coming down and the businesses are struggling and therefore we should control the the wage increase for for the sake of maintaining uh, employment Leia, uh, Leia, Leia, while while at it we really appreciate uh, uh, your experience sharing, but uh, I would also want to ask you something about your preparations towards the negotiations. Have you had a chance of uh, sharing your business circumstances beforehand so that as you approach the negotiations, the unions are pretty aware about what level of compromise you can entertain under the prevailing business circumstances, if you can comment on that? Yes, before we negotiate, we normally do a, uh, a sort of presentation and we in the past we have sat with the union even before we commence negotiations and we go through a, a very detailed um, snapshot of the performance of the business our experience especially in uh, 2016 when we had very serious problems with the union we went as far as engaging um, economists both government and private and we prepared very detailed papers the union also prepared theirs but uh, at the end of the day they still insisted that they needed money there is sometimes uh, a lot of misconception amongst uh, our labor force and the union by the kind of uh, reports they hear from uh, the ministry when it's announced that uh, the tea farmers have, um, have got so many billions this year or the tea sector has made so much billion. But you see, we are, we are just looking at uh, the total uh, outcome. We, we've not looked at the cost of production. Sometimes the individual companies have made losses, but the announcement out there looks like we are making billions of shillings. So the union say, no, you're making a lot of billions. Even the government announced the other day that the tea industry has made so much. So th these are things that uh, impact on our negotiations. Uh, we get to haggle a lot with the union and we don't sometimes get to an agreement. Have I oh. answered your question? Uh, thank you, thank you, Leah. Thank you very much, Leah. I think you answered Mr. Mbok's question. Thank you very, very much. And you're bringing experience uh, sharing from the agricultural sector and uh, far away from the city in Nairobi, as you say. So you're basically rural based. So thank you for sharing that. Can we now have uh, Amos Odiambo? Amos Odiambo? Let's see. Introduce yourself. Amos. Unmute. Emos, are you there? Okay, let's move on to Ann Wamaida. Ann Wamaida. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can hear you. Introduce yourself, the company you present, and proceed. Okay, my name is Anna Maida. I work for Mara Farming, where exporters of cash vegetables and fruits. So I haven't had the privilege of working with a union, so it goes without saying that I don't have any experience with CBAs. But I was told to talk about what I fear, and my fears for working with CBAs, from what I have heard from my colleagues and uh, people in the industry we are in is that unions are sometimes are very demanding and at times uh, working with unions can be very hard but uh, some people say that when you the, the initial stage is where there are problems and that if you get your systems in order then working with unions can be pretty interesting and good and uh, beneficial for both parties both the employer and the employee so what we do at my workplace, which is our alternative for the union, we have a workers' welfare. These positions, they're elective. People are elected to the positions. 
and their officials sit in the management to negotiate terms for their employees. So far, that has worked well for us. And especially right now, during this pandemic, uh, they, when they were negotiating about the hours of work and also the, um, the wage, we have been fortunate enough <coughs> sorry, to be listed as one of the essential services. So we were not affected by the COVID. We did not close and we did not let anyone go. So what, were, what the people needed was only the terms of work to ensure that their safety came first which the workers' welfare represented themselves well and management was also willing to listen to them. So, yeah, that's my take. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we still have a few more of you who will speak uh, live, but I want to hand over this back to Ombok so that we can... Uh, look at the next question uh i can see the robo is there but let, let's let's digress a little bit the robo we shall come back shall come back to you even at grace manugu we hope to get you uh so let me hand this back to nyaga i think nyaga proceed yes thank you very much uh, I think we have uh, had the first question, uh, and uh, now uh, it's time we can go to the second one and uh, see and try to get some uh, uh, experience uh, from the field from you guys. And the question is, uh, how would you advise uh, parties to impact uh, negotiations to construct their CMB? How would you advise parties to impact negotiations? Uh, to construct their MOUs and uh, MOAs. Uh, somebody uh, come up and uh, give us uh, kind of uh, an advice or kind of an experience, a kind of an understanding from your side so that uh, we can share, we are sharing. So, Karibu. So, the question has been presented. Let's see anybody who is willing to contribute. can raise your hand. And by the way, Grace Manugu, you are still on the queue. I don't know why. Maybe you're having a problem with unmuting. This is all um, new to it. Ah, or is that Norobo? Yes. Okay, I'll Norobo. just give it a try. I'll just give it a try for purposes of making maybe the class a bit uh, <laughs> lively now that you've all gone mute. But I would um on the second question, uh, how I would advise parties to impact negotiations or con uh, to construct their MOUs is. Given this eventuality that has now um, befell us, remember we had never envisaged that we would have a situation where actually businesses will close down and it's not just a question of a particular one, but uh, thinking globally and nationally, we would never have uh, envisaged a situation where we would all be told to work from home and uh, still uh, not just uh, come up and uh, 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 tell our, our staff to go home, you know, uh, a question of uh, declaring redundancy and then um, talking about separation, employee separation. So my advice would be, given that uh, nature has given us this kind of a scenario, uh, I think all parties while drafting their MOUs would have to put an eventuality in the back of their minds that in case of an eventuality, what will be the fallback? So that either they organize the employer or the employee does not suffer in such a situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Norobo. Uh, and like I'm, I'm seeing quite a number of comments on the chat box as well. I'm seeing questions on the Q&A as well. Lillian Oyata, thank you very much for your observation. Uh, yes, indeed, all the delegates in industry have given their views, and Ombok will also be clarifying a few issues as we continue, and so will uh, Nyaga be doing the same. So let's move to the third question. 
Nyaga. Yes, the land question uh, is there. It can be seen quite well. It reads, how would you prepare for CBA negotiations under the prevailing business uncertainty? Or again, how would you prepare for business negotiation under the prevailing business uncertainty? Uh, what is your take? How would you go about that? Let us hear from you again. Again, raise your hand and let's see. Ah, now we have Evanson. Thank you. Evanson. Hi. Hi. Good Evanson. morning. Morning. Am I clear? You are quite clear. Introduce yourself, the company you represent, and proceed. Yes, I'm Evanson Waweru. I represent Karirana Estates, the home of Eden T. And I'll also be talking about uh, the negotiations being part of the negotiating team. And uh, there are quite a lot of learning in this session, and particularly on the issue of the virtual engagement, where we have had to engage on virtual with the union. And one of the preparations is that as a team, you need to be sure what you want. I wouldn't say that uh, the union have been quite uh, that aggressive, that is negotiating at the uh, Kenya Tea Growers Association. Uh, I have seen a bit of understanding from the union because as we speak, uh, we only have uh, a few crosses which uh, are remaining. But the biggest issue is on the issue of indicating to the union that uh, there is need for a freeze in wages, especially during this time of COVID. Of course, there is the element that uh, this COVID has hit all of us. But now putting it that uh, this is a situation which is affecting all of us. It's an issue that uh, would need a lot of preparations and you have the figures being open to one another and indicating that indeed the sustenance of the business uh, require the sitting together of all of us as stakeholders. The issue of the duration, we have been used to two years, uh, CBA. Now, impressing upon the union that probably because none is aware of how long COVID is going to take, none leader can say that it is one year, two years, three years, and therefore the issue of the duration of the CBA is an area that needs to go into the name of you and, uh, and understand how far are you saying that you can change this duration, maybe three years, four years. And uh, one uh, another area that we have seen being a challenge is like now uh, impressing upon the union. 2022 is an election year. And if we'll be talking about negotiating, can we rock? and probably have a time, uh, a duration whereby maybe there will be no negotiations during the election periods, such kind of things. But uh, team, the other issue that we have seen is this combined CBA, where you have stakeholders within one CBA, and one of one or two are saying, we are not able to, uh, to, to manage the provisions of the CBA. What do you do? And uh, you are at the one uh, CBA. That indeed has been a major challenge. And then uh, we are all aware that uh, industries are undergoing a lot of challenges. And where you learn, you learn to the labor offices. I think one of the things that needs clear understanding is that all of us should be in a position to understand what uh, the industry is going through. 
So it may be provided, uh, it may be provided in the CBAs and even in the labor rules, but the current situations we haven't seen, all of us have not seen this in the, uh, 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 of course, none has ever seen what we are going through this. And therefore with a clear understanding, we are able to say, yes, this one is provided, but for the time being, let also the employees understand that you cannot push the industry to some extent. Probably there needs to be some understanding in that regard. I think that is what I have for the essence of time, but it is quite an engaging, uh, it's quite an engaging uh, time that we are all sharing together. Thank you. Much appreciated, Ivanson, Asante Sana. I can see a comment from Emma Kerubo. She had spoken earlier. For the sake of time, I'll just read it so that we all benefit. So Emma says, my take on preparations for negotiations is to focus on the financial clauses while taking into consideration business continuity and saving jobs. You should have your figures at hand and consider the impact of anticipated proposals so that you are in a position to determine how far you can balance. Thank you, Emma, for that chat you have put in there. We now have Francis Ogola. Francis, I want to put you live, please. Unmute and Francis, your hand was up. Okay, so we maybe the weak connection. I would like to invite. Amos Odiambo, I had called upon you earlier. I don't know whether you are now able to speak. No. Are you able to? Is that Amos? Hello. Amos, I think your connection yes. is unstable. Can you get? Yes, but no? you. Oh, Amos, your connection is unstable. Maybe we'll try a bit later. Do we have balance? Oh. Oops. Do, okay, let's have Evelyn Opio. Evelyn. Hello. Hello, Evelyn. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, introduce yourself fully and proceed. Um, Evelyn Opio, I work for Kisumu Water and Sanitation Company. Always refreshing life. Now, in the water sector, it has been very difficult for us that uh, given that most of us are not financed by the government, so we rely on sales we make. And given the economic recession the country and the world is going through, our customers are not able to pay their bills on time. So we tend to lag behind in our collections, hence affecting our operations. So in the last 20 years, we've frozen our salaries and maintained our terms and conditions of employment as they were, hoping that maybe the coming days, the situation will improve. And then we'll sit down with our union to discuss on whatever issues we need to factor in our new CBA, because the old one had expired. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. Francis, are you able to speak? Francis, okay. Right, so we will try Bernice, Bernice, uh, Bernice Kasaya. You want to give us your experiences? Even if yeah. you're not Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Banis Kasaya. Actually, I do not work in a CBA environment. I'm working with the Nature Conservancy uh, Africa region. So much of the Kenyan experience, I may not have it, but I would want to talk about 
My short stint with CBA when I was serving as a board member, uh, HR, chair of the HR uh, sub board committee of a technical institution. So what I've since learned or what I learned and what was able to assist us is that for a CBA to actually work, like what we did is uh, parties, this is uh, the employer employees and the trade union officials or the party that uh, the industry uh, group representing the uh, trade union in the organization, uh, these parties have to come up with a recognition agreement or what we are calling the MOU. And just basically that is this, the starting point of whether it will be successful or not, where it has, both of them have to agree that either the parties or the employees can join an existing one or join or form a new one and then come into an agreement document everything, sign and work with it. And that will be the guidance for how the parties will be interacting. So thing, a few things that happened for us and I saw the CBA in this particular training institution work was that there was active engagement between the CBA and the management in that the management was very, very open. It lay on the table, their financial status, because this was an institution funded by the government. And then the employees who joined the union were the employees being paid from funds locally sourced through the board of, um, is it the BOG, the board of governors through cost sharing. So, one thing that I realized was that so long as you agree that these are going to guide, our CBA is going to be for two years. And what we agreed on, we agreed for a two year term. So what we agreed on, every time we needed to make any amends or something happened, we went back to the table to sit and discuss and agree. And we did not have a problem. So because the, the union officials understood the financial status of the organization. They understood the terms and conditions of the CBA, what the college could do and what it could not do because of the limitations in terms of its willingness to go beyond what the funding they are getting. And just before COVID-19 started, uh, there, was a, there were a group of employees, unionized employees, who stole from the college. And because we followed the due process of engaging with each other at every stage of the disciplinary process, we were able to like have these employees, three employees were uh, summarily dismissed without any court battles or anything because of that understanding. So my take to the, to the HR, colleagues who are not directly involved with CBS is first of all, to really understand what you are getting into. What are the terms and conditions? And at what point do you always need to come back and discuss? Because once the union officials understand that the management have an open door policy for us to engage with them, then the interactions and participations will be very amicable and everything will work well. So I have not had a lot of interaction because my term ended sometime mid last year, but that's what I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you, Bernice. We, it's a good perspective also to hear from those who have not interacted with the uh, unions because you could be an HR in a company that doesn't have a union, but tomorrow you join one which has a union or even if your company doesn't have a union, a union can come knocking. Thank you, Bernice. We have Claudio Otieno. Uh, Claudio Otieno and Gerard Matoke, please prepare. Gerard, prepare. But for now, let's have Claudio Otieno. Claudio, unmute. Your hand was raised. All right, shall we search for Gerard Matoke? Gerard Matoke. 
Thank you, my friends. You get me? Am I allowed? Please, Gerald, introduce yourself fully. Which company and proceed? Yeah, my name is Gerald Matoke from Del Monte, where we say yes to the best. We've been in this business for so long. Anyway, we have very st uh, two, two strong unions where we negotiate every two years. And um, I will straight on go to the question. How will you prepare for CPA negotiations? Well, one thing is um, for this time, I will ask to, I wish to ask the members from FKE to be our um, frontliners because uh, I've already pointed in my chat box that um, one, even if we have everything put on the table, the union will ask for more. And it has been really uh, not easy to deal with. I will wish this kind of conversation to be undertaken by yourselves uh, with the unions as well to get the information that in, it, we, are, we are really operating in a very unique times because uh, we seem to have one party having more information than the other. Uh, even if you negotiate with the union, they will, they will, they will, they, you will present everything, financials, the condition, um, taking into account the situation where you are. But at the end of the day, you'll have to, 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 to be told to, to give something and give at a range that is not acceptable. So I think FKE has a role to play here. Give the union information so that they are also inform, informed that this is for both stakeholders. It's not for one party to save jobs and um, of course do run up and down and uh, ensure employees are compensated every month. So uh, for the negotiations to start, I think we have done from our experience with the two strong unions we have, we've done, we've always done our pitch. Number one, we take the union through before the CPA starts, we show our financials, but that doesn't come to any result. So the issue of preparation, for example, uh, I think you should take a, a role or a, a front role in terms of ensuring that uh, the union understands the employer, the position of the employer, which we find it very, very difficult to pass by. We go to negotiations subdued because at the time of economic uh, negotiations, as far as, as wages, uh, there is no even no, there's no even negotiations. You present the accounts, you present every condition where you are, nobody listens to you. And uh, at the end of the day, you hear, okay, we are going to, we, we, we need 5% uh, or 10% not looking at the issue of um, securing jobs, the business uh, uh, performance and certainty during COVID. Th this is not taken seriously. So for this time, uh, the kind of negotiation we should have is uh, one, try to freeze wages where we can, but I know it's very difficult. So the, the end result could be very minimal conversations in terms of rates to, so that we keep our, our, our employees at work. That's one. Two, I don't know what you can advise because even if you give financials, the position where you are, they never read. And uh, you being the, our, our, our advocates, take it to the union. That is one thing uh, towards preparations for these years negotiations or uh, the due negotiations that are coming up. So ours from Del Monte, it has not been easy, I must say. We've, uh, we, we, we've been into this and uh, what we got is to have a very cardio relationship so that we don't end up uh, uh, in a situation whereby our employees will suffer. Uh, mine, uh, my experience in this field, negotiations have to be open. Sometimes we lay foundations where, where we say, yes, uh, this time is uh, bad. We are not doing very well. And as you know, unions sometimes they think an employer is always doing well. We give a clear cut uh, points, okay, margins where we can reach, let's say 5% or below. But then we end up giving more. And this I find is as a loose end from uh, 
the institutions that may be, that is yourselves, ourselves, and, uh, uh, and, and the way we advocate towards the unions. So it is good to be open. It's good to show the impact of COVID. The costs are there. We are putting measures in the workplace, which is all a cost. Uh, but I don't know. This one I can pose to the team here or to yourselves, FKE, as our advocates. How can we work together to make our social partners understand that we are in this situation, uh, all of us, and we need to work towards ensuring business continuity and uh, giving our people a chance to work. Uh, it's better you get something small, go home, rather than uh, missing everything. From Del Monte, one thing I like to put across is we've not really gone around to, 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 to maybe slash the wages. Everybody is paid as uh, by the CPA, but then I see a, a problem. Uh, in the coming days. So that's, that's, that will be my observation, my friends, in the FKG team. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Gerald. Francis, Francis, is your connectivity okay now? All right. Francis, if you're not okay, then we had Irene. Irene Kizaiga. Irene, let's search for you, Irene. Irene, 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 unmute and ask your question. I think you had a question yourself. Yes. Introduce yes, yourself. Good morning. My name is uh, Irene Gedeiga, and uh, I represent uh, Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, based in Mombasa, the, our headquarters. Um, my question, I had raised a question uh, regarding uh, a CBA. Um, we've gone through the experience of negotiating with the union uh, last year during the, just uh, the start of pandemic. We had uh, some several meetings, engagement meetings, and uh, we were able to agree on many issues because we stated uh, the status of the uh, uh, financial positions of the institution. Uh, we went through and we were able to finalize uh, uh, with about uh, three me uh, meetings with the, the union uh, until last year, around September, October, we signed uh, between uh, the management and uh, the union. And we had the representative from the uh, UNLISC. The, um, the Union of um, National Research Institutions. Um, so after we signed the uh, the CBA, we uh, we were guided they just to, to go through the, the registration, and uh, the Secretary General to uh, unrisk um, uh, got all the information he wanted after we signed. But uh, later on, beginning of uh, this year, February, we got a letter from uh, SRC, uh, simply because uh, the, CBA, uh, the CBA that uh, we developed, uh, the institution had a gap. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, there was no record of a signed uh, CBA agreement. And, and so we had like one CBA calling uh, two uh, phases, the one from 2014 to 2018, and then 2018 to 2021. So this was not accepted by SRC. And uh, uh, they informed us that they were, not, they were constrained to provide the clearance for registration for this uh, particular CBA. So from here, and um, this, uh, uh, this training has been very uh, useful. I've been following up, and uh, uh, I know we can uh, get uh, um, advice on how to proceed with this, whether we ignore the gap that uh, we did not have a CBA and uh, uh, we devise this other one to just to suit uh, the current status from 2018 to 2021, which is almost now going almost going to uh last we're almost uh, going to start another negotiation for from uh, first july 2021 for the, the next four years 
Okay, yes. I really think we've got the gist of your question. Yes. And uh, Ombok, Ombok will be advising as we proceed. Yeah. Yes. He has taken note of your question. And yes. The issue of the gap uh, yes. and, uh, and how SRC intervened. Thank and you. Proceed. So it will be answered. It'll okay. Be answered. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate. So at this juncture, I would like to revert back to our presentation and uh, Moses Ombok, if you are ready, we proceed. We still have a number of questions which were posted and they will also be answered. So let's, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, we still have some time and then we'll come back to the question, live questions and also uh, what we are responding to on the chat. Thank you. So Ombok, let's proceed. So, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, that is good, uh, participants. Uh, it's good we have heard a lot from you. Uh, there's a slide uh, that we wanted to share with you where we will be asking you questions live. We are done with that. Uh, what it means now is that uh, we go and answer the questions that uh, you had actually uh, posed. And I would want to start with uh, Leia Kibi. Uh, Leia is wondering whether the unions have been honoring the MOUs. Yes, the unions do honor MOUs. And in most cases, you are required, first of all, uh, to have consulted with the union. If you remember uh, the earlier, in my earlier presentation, I alluded to the procedure that parties are supposed to follow. The first, the very first obligation on the part of the parties is to consult, consult, and consult. Then after consulting, you reduce that in writing. And once you have reduced it in writing, then it becomes very easy for you uh, to honor you up again at, uh, and your ob obligations under the MOU. So uh, Leah, be assured that the unions will always honor the MOUs as long as they were consulted and the resultant agreement was uh, reduced in writing. They will honor those same more use. Then uh, the next question we had from Annalisa Mukuria, uh, whether it is possible to register MOUs agreed between parties in 2020. Uh, the first, in the first instance, the MOUs are supposed to be registered with a, a commissioner for labor or rather filed with a commissioner for labor. And uh, some of the best examples that I gave include the KQ. KQ uh, or the uh, Kenya Airways, if you like, have been signing MOS and registering this in court as an addendum. And this is very important for the reason that once they are registered as, uh, as an addendum to the existing CBA, the parties get serious in implementation of these MOUs and more importantly, I, uh, Amelita, you are supposed to have an MOU with a clause as to when these MOUs can be reviewed, more of a monitoring and implementation clause. That would also make you keep track, look at the nature of how your business is performing and see whether you can go back and uh, have these MOUs uh, reviewed. Uh, the third question we have is from uh, Jacob uh, Lesirma. Uh, your question relates as to whether M uh, FK can assist you in ensuring that your CBA lasts for four years, other than two years. Of course, when you are in the government sector, uh, the SRC guideline is that the uh, CBA's life uh, cycle should go up to four years. That is, uh, that is a legal uh, force. But when you come to the private sector, you are required to have a CBA that lasts uh, for as long as parties can agree. We have CBAs in the private sector that runs for two years. Some run for three, some even run for four years. But the debate has been around, when should these CBAs be reviewed again? Because in most cases, we have had CBAs that the unions will come and say, oh, you see, uh, the inflation rate has changed the purchasing power of our members. We want to negotiate again. If you take us for four years, 
then we will not have this opportunity. And then the employer also comes and says, but you see, I do not want to keep on negotiating after every year. I want to concentrate on doing my business. So it's upon parties actually to agree on this. And uh, FKE can only help you and guide you as of, uh, in uh, the merits and demerits of having a shorter time. Uh, that means I need to go to the fifth question. This came from Gladys Otieno. As to what is my take on SRC? Yes, SRC uh, is constituted under the Constitution of Kenya, and uh, their mandates are very clear. I like what SRC has been doing. Before SRC was constituted, we had a situation where in the public sector, our uh, institutions and government departments did not have wages being regulated, being controlled. We had a situation where others would have higher wages, others would have low wages, even the persons in the same uh, level of employment in the government sector. So SRC's role is just to advise you on how you can budget and sustain the resultant wage bills that arise from CBA negotiations. And the SRC has done, a, for me, a good job. Although uh, it depends on which side of the coin you are in. Some people would say that SRC has not done their job and uh, it's a hindrance to the bargaining. Imagine where you had a situation where parties are not negotiating with any well-defined beacons. And that is what SRC has been assisting parties to do because it is you to prove that the budget you have for the wages, you can sustain for the period that the CBA will be up and running. So uh, for me, I think the SRC is doing their job. Now, on uh, the sixth question that came from Mr. Gerald Matoke, how can FKE assist you to have realistic negotiations? Because you are coming from the experience where you have shared your financial status with the two unions that you are describing as strong. And at the end of the day, you still have a protracted negotiations that take a long time uh, to conclude. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, the best thing to do is to be open, uh, share data, and that sometimes I know the employers usually have a problem when they refuse to say, uh, share this data. Because there is no point in you waiting for the Employment and Labor Relations Court to order the Central uh, Monitoring and Planning Unit, uh, Planning and Monitoring Unit, to come and extract your books of account and really study your a profit and loss account and the liquidity status so that they advise the court as to what extent uh, you can compromise on financial clauses. So if you are open in your negotiations, you have shared data, you should be able to take lead and uh, have these negotiations done expeditiously. And one of the areas where we have had CBS being negotiated even within a day, even for two hours, is where the parties allowed us, the employers allowed us to train the negotiation team, comprising union leaders and management leaders, and especially the ones who are coming to negotiate the CBA. And once that training has taken place, we have a record of one or two sittings, and therefore we finalize uh, the negotiations. That has been very, very useful. If anything, that is provided for in the law. If you look at uh, section uh, 57 of the Labor Relations Act, it is a requirement that before parties negotiate, the employer is supposed to share that information with the union. And once that information is shared, then it becomes very uh, realistic for parties to engage and conclude the CBA expeditiously. Uh, I have another question from uh, 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 Mr. Balala, who is uh, wondering whether we can include uh, a retirement clause in CBA negotiations. Yes, Mr. Balala, this is a negotiable uh, uh, a clause in the CBA. Nothing stops you from proposing to the union so that you agree on the retirement age and entrench this in the CBA so that both parties know their obligations when it comes to retiring an employee, what is the role of the employer and what is the role of the employee and the union at large. So that should be done. 
Uh, uh, the last but not least question that I would not I would want to handle came from Irene of Kenya Marine. You are talking about and risk and the general secretary, uh, led by one one of my friends, uh, Mr. Chacha, that you have been negotiating with. And I realized when you are presenting your uh, question that uh, you started negotiating without approaching SRC. And I think this is where the rent started beating you. Uh, the rule of the thumb require that before you start negotiating in the public sector, and I'm talking about any organization that is funded by the exchequer or treasury, if you like, it is a requirement that you consult your mother ministry and therefore uh, seek approval of the SRC as to how you are going to fund the resultant agreement. So that once SRC gives you an advisory, that is what you adopt as your counter proposal to the union. It is uh, actually a risk for you to negotiate before you get SRC approval. Then after you have negotiated, then SRC comes and gives you advisory. What it means is that that CPA cannot be accepted for registration in Employment and Labor Relations Court for want of approval by the SRC. So moving forward, you are supposed to insist that you get approval from SRC, which then you share with the union as your counter proposal before you start negotiations. And at that point, you will not have any hitch as you head to the Employment and Labor Relations Court for the registration of your CBA. And at this point, participants, allow me now uh, to uh, usher, my, usher in uh, my counterpart and my colleague, Ms. Anyaga, to deal with the subsequent questions. Ms. Anyaga. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have a few questions here, but uh, in the interest of question, uh, I mean, in the interest of time, I will not take uh, ma ma much time. I'll try to answer them directly. One of these is by uh, Mr. Peter Wangige, who, says, who asked, what happens when a CBE has expired and yet the negotiation for the next uh, period, the next period are delaying for some reasons. When a CBE, uh, when the rest of the CBE uh, expires, the CBA continues to be effecting until another one is negotiated. So uh, you can't uh, say that now that it has come to an end, we stop uh, implementing it. Now that cannot that cannot work. You continue implementing what is there until another one is negotiated and uh, agreed on. So there will be nothing like a, like a gap in between there. Uh, the other question is from Mr. Uh, from Joshua Kauru. Who asked what happens if, CB, if a CBA is assigned um, but the union does not pursue the registration? Uh, yes, the, the, the CBA is supposed to be uh, uh, registered before it is uh, uh, actualized, but if the union does not pursue registration, then the employer can, can do that. The employer has uh, got the right to go ahead and, uh, and implement it. And uh, here at the, at the FKE, we assist. Uh, uh, employers in having those documents uh, registered as required. Then there's another question that came from a straight forwarding company. Actually, there are two questions from there. One is about uh, whether it's possible to negotiate a, a CPA uh, down once. <coughs> a review of uh, CB or, or, any, or any document means that it can take any directions depending on the situation uh, uh, prevailing. So yes, with a CBA, uh, if you agree, you can uh, negotiate it down once. But uh, a word of caution is that uh, it's almost impossible. It's very difficult for you after you're given a uh, 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 certain, uh, you're given into the unit to some, uh, in, in some certain section and you're assigned, and then you come back and tell them, can we now review, review, review it down once? It's possible, it's lawful, but uh, it becomes very difficult for the union to agree to that because again, remember this union is also under pressure because it's, it's uh, being, uh, it's representing some workers. So it will have to have someone to, to explain to those workers why these uh, conditions has, uh, has been made less available than it used uh, to be there before. Then there was another question uh, was that, uh, where there is a CBA, 
And uh, because of this COVID situation, uh, uh, the, uh, the, a, com a company is unable to implement it. Can it have a, uh, an MOU? That's why what we were saying. I think yes, you can have those MOU, and uh, maybe in those MOU you can temporarily uh, suspend some some clauses. You can even agree on a, 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 on a salary uh, a cut. You can agree on uh, unpaid leave or partial paid leave. Those kinds, of, this uh, kind of uh, agreements can can uh, can uh, be uh, um, taken up by the parties. Then there was also another question still from a street funding asking uh, where the supply is being by a group of companies and uh, an enterprise is uh, one of the enter one or two enterprises the company in the group companies are unable to cope with that CBA. What would happen to that? Uh, what we would advise is that uh, if you're in such a kind of situation, then uh, then approach the group that negotiates for you and uh, discuss with them, let them approach uh, the union, and uh, you see if you can come up with a kind of an MOU that would kind of exempt you from some clauses or that would alter some uh, uh, some uh, uh, so some clauses so that you can uh, have a, a, a space to breathe and then you'll be able to move uh, to move forward. Or if the group is not there, if the probably the group uh, is not in, uh, uh, able to approach the union, you as an, uh, as an enterprise can also approach that union that is signatory to that CBA and uh, discuss uh, your problems. And uh, from there, you can come up with, uh, with an MOU in addition to, uh, to, to that CBA and uh, an MOU that will definitely have uh, 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 some, um, some dates for, for, for review, not just an, an, an open MOU. It has to uh, be agreeing that this one takes uh, time for maybe uh, about uh, uh, three, four, five months. Then after that, it can be reviewed. And from there, you come and review again and see if you can revert to the CBA, you proceed with it, or you adjust it and date. I think those are the questions that were, were put to me, and uh, now I'm uh, through with them. And I think I will now hand over uh, to Mr. Mayera. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nyaga. Uh, and Moses Sombok for those uh, good uh, responses uh, to all those questions. Today we have had quite a number of questions. I'm seeing they are still streaming in and uh, a number of them we are answering. Uh, we have our colleague uh, Dickens. Dickens, uh, Uma, you wanted to contribute something very quickly. I'll give you one minute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Dickens, proceed. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something uh, that uh, my colleague Nyaga was saying with respect to registration of a CBA. Uh, what happens when the union does not facilitate registration? I, I want to say this, it is in the interest of the employer that the registration is registered as fast as possible. Normally, when you look at your CBAs, the last clause reads something to the effect that the terms of this CBA shall be in force until a subsequent CBA is registered. But it is in your best interest because in most cases, if it delays registration, and if it delays implementation, then you'll be saddled with the aspect of payment of arrears. So in most cases, and it is it's not unusual to come to an agreement immediately you finish the negotiation that you shall begin implementation even before registration. On financial aspects, it is in your best interest. So do not leave it to the union, but follow it up. We normally facilitate that. We normally help uh, our members to push for the process to be completed before it is taken to court for registration. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Very fantastic contribution from uh, our senior legal officer, Mr. Dickens Ouma. You'll remember you heard him yesterday and the day before. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are coming to the end of our presentations today. As is usual, if your question has not been answered, you can still write an email to any officer in the Federation or through me, and, and you'll get your answers uh, right there on your email for records. So at this point, I want to request, I'll be requesting our executive director, who has also been listening in, uh, she'll be making her closing remarks. Uh, and when she's done, we shall do a small poll, the poll, just to see how you read uh, the whole thing. And I'll be making an announcement for the next uh, 
modular uh, cl masterclass, which will be in April. So our executive director will give her remarks, and essentially she'll actually be closing the, 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 the class. But as I said, after that, I'll just give some uh, housekeeping announcements. Thank you, and welcome our CEO. Thank you very much, Eric. It's been an exciting two hours uh, listening to your questions, your comments, and presentations by both Ombok and uh, Nyaga. These are not normal times that we are living in, but life must go on and business must be done and employees must be looked after. One of the ways of doing that is through collective bargaining as we have been learning and uh, people have different experiences. Some of you don't come from enterprises that have unions, but as we saw on Monday, it is still important for employers to understand the current trends, the demands that have been put on us, because the scenario is that every time there's a challenge, there's a problem, there's a pandemic, there are proposals to amend laws, there are proposals to introduce new things which are good, such as unemployment insurance. We have been pushing the government for social protection, expansion, and saving of jobs. But at the end of the day, the costs come back to us. So how do we navigate these difficult times? So you still need to know how to manage employee relations into which collective bargaining falls. Over the last three days, in the last uh, three classes, today being the last one, some themes that have come is really the role of social dialogue in labor relations. And collective bargaining negotiations is, is social dialogue. You, you do it through dialogue, through exchange of views, through offers and counter offers, through accommodation, and it is founded on trust and fairness. There are those who believe that the connect, collective bargaining process is where one party tries to gain an advantage over the other because it's bargaining. And we Africans are very good at bargaining. A lady tells you your mango is 20 bob, you still want to bargain. So some view it as being something like buying something from a store and you want to pay less than the value of that uh, item or product. That is really not the spirit because it is looking at the employees and saying this is a valued asset and also looking at the employer's capacity and saying, what can we put into improving employees' terms and how much do we need to reserve to reinvest into the enterprise for tomorrow and absorb more people into employment and even improving the terms and conditions in which work is done, not the money into the pocket, but the situation in the office. So it's a, it's a delicate process. And you are asking us about social dialogue. And we did say that this is one of the areas we'll be looking at. Then a whole host of issues that arise from the employer-employee relationship. A number of you are talking about separation being one of the areas that you could be beginning on. Of course, the salary increases. And if you do have to vary the contracts, then how do you do that? That's what we're being asked. What about unions? How do you deal with unions? Uh, how do you handle them? How do you um, expose certain facts and figures? Can you trust them? Will they understand it? Because for many years, the unions have always assumed that employers have two sets of figures. One that they present to unions and another one that they hide and present to the auditors, which really is not true because most, most businesses get audited. These are published uh, data. And we at FKE do not encourage that kind of conduct and our employers actually do not do that. But if, if parties can then accept the data and see what to do with it uh, in terms of plowing back to the enterprise and improving the what goes into the employee's pocket, then that makes a difference. Yesterday, when you were looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the workplace, a lot of the questions were around, how do you manage employees at this time? How do you protect them? How do you cover them? How do you assess their performance? How do you support them on the psychosocial issues that are arising? This remote working from home, and it's beginning to look like we may have to consider doing that come next week because of the trends we are seeing, how then do you manage employee issues? What protocols apply at this time? 
What about non-compliance with the protocols? How do you deal with that? When employees don't comply um, and uh, you know it's endangering both their lives and the lives of other employees, how do you deal with that? Which then brings us to today and the conversations about three or four main themes and issues that we want to highlight. One is the role of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, whom for public sector institutions, you're supposed to consult, you're supposed to get their agreement on the parameters of uh, increases that you're offering. What can the enterprise afford? Uh, I was on the SRC, I was one of the first uh, commissioners in the first term, and even now employers have a commissioner at SRC. So SRC is not an animal that we, is a stranger to us and we support their work. The important thing, as Moses said, is prior consultations and where you're in difficulties. We can talk to SRC, we can write to them. They're very open to meeting people so, so that they understand the issues pertaining to that particular enterprise, even as they seek to stabilize. How do you prepare for the collective bargaining process? And the issue of prior preparation, training by FKE. Some employers avoid our role in that and they start off on their own, then they get stuck. Then they come to us when parties have entrenched their positions and their strains in the relationship, rather than coming together with a negotiating team from the union and the leadership from the employers and looking at the trends in the sector, the trends in, at global level, the trends at national level, and your own particular statistics and getting ready for that process. It makes it very easy. Sometimes that process is concluded in one sitting or two sittings. Our target actually in our service charter to you as employers, which we'll be sharing with you, we'd like to conclude these meetings in a maximum of three sessions, if possible or less. So please ask FKE for support and we have our team here. You can talk to Nyaga, you can talk to Moses and there are others, even Dickens who was uh, chipping in. Then the other area was the implementation of CBS before registration. Now this is not allowed by law. A CBA must be registered for it to get a uh, legal uh, authority, for it to become a legal document. You need to register it. So sometimes there are objections from SRC because parties did not seek SRC's input. Sometimes the unions themselves may object or an employer may object, but really the law requires that CBAs be registered. And because our lawyers are in court every day, we also assist members in that process so our encouragement is that you ensure that your CBAs are registered um, after completion so that they can be sanctioned by law to be implemented. I want to end by thanking you all for your participation, encouraging you to remain alert to what is happening in the environment. If you face new challenges, you can chat with us. We have a website where you can reach us. We are in the process of digitalizing where it would be easier for you to contact us. But even now you can reach us on email, you can reach us on phone, and we are ready to respond to your questions. Thank you for your participation, and we wish you well as you implement the learnings that you have acquired over the last three days. Asanteni Sana. Thank you, thank you. That's our CEO, uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Mugo. Thank you so much for being with us from the start until today and uh, actually contributing to the debates and the conversations. Now, we're going to have a poll, a quick poll shortly, but I wish, I wish to announce that uh, for those of you who have attended the three modules, you will earn your CPD points from IHRM, and uh, I will be sending the recordings of this masterclass uh, most likely tomorrow, and you'll also get certificates by next week. Our next masterclass will be very interesting. It will be how to start and improve your own business. Remember, these are very uncertain times and uh, employee jobs are being lost. Uh, what we used to call uh, or look uh, side hustles is now a real thing. And we talked about, George Massesa talked about the gig economy when we began on Tuesday. Most of you are already doing your hustles. So that's the gig economy. You wouldn't want to miss this masterclass on starting and improving your own business. 
We are running this jointly with ILO. So it's very high level and very, very well crafted. So be on the lookout. It will be on 20th, 21st, and 22nd of April. I will be sending out, or we shall be sending out this communication by next week so that you begin registering for the same. So with that, I think I join my CEO in thanking everybody, thanking my CEO, thanking all the panelists, starting with the George Masese, Deacon Souma, Grace Kaume, Moses Sombok, uh, Joseph Nyaga, and of course, even our IT team who have worked behind the scenes to make this very, very successful. I thank you all, and I thank you delegates. Now, take just five minutes or even less to do this poll and uh, submit it to us. Thank you, Asanteni. The poll is on. Ah, very good. I can see lots of you scoring. Very good. Asante Nisana. Keep it, keep it, keep it going. This is very useful for us. Some of you are also commenting on the chat box. Asante Nisana. Uh, thank you very much. This helps us to improve on what we are doing. And in the poll, there will also be a space for you to suggest any other new or innovative programs you like us to do. But remember, the one I mentioned, start and improve your own business, is coming next. You wouldn't want to miss that one. The dates are 20th, 21st, and 22nd of April on this platform. Very, very convenient to most of you now. Thank you. Thank you and bye bye. Asante Sana, Nancy Butama. Most of you are commenting. Asante Nisana for this, and not just for the comment, for your participation as well. So let's finish the poll in the next one minute or so. All right, one minute. We want to end the poll. Oh, Sabrina, you're trying to submit. <laughs> Sorry. Jacqueline Musau, thank you very much. Officially, and uh, we shall also be ending the session officially. Uh, you'll also see our contacts on the screen. Okay, I think that is done. Thank you. So we have ended the poll. Thank you very much. And we already have your results at Santini Sana. And with that, maybe I'll request uh, the entire team just to say bye-bye, those who can wave, starting with our CEO. Our CEO, you'll see her, she's waving. Let's see Ombok. Let's see Joseph Nyaga. And of course, myself on behalf of those <laughs> who are not here with us and the rest of the FKE team. Asante Nisana, we'll see you on the next webinar or the next masterclass. Thank you. <laughs> Shiriki shetu,
Tia wajiri wetu Tunasema asante Wajiri wasante Wanachara asante Washirika asante Tunasema asante Wajiri wasante Wanachara asante Washirika asante Sema asante, wajiri wasante